Good morning, everybody. Thank you all for joining us. We're just gonna kind of slow roll the start here until everybody makes it in from the waiting room. And that's happened faster than it does most weeks. Thank you all so much for joining us. We're happy to have you here with us this week. We have a lot of questions to cover today. We had something like 18 questions come in in advance. So <clears throat> we're gonna try to move through things a little more quickly than we usually do. So I'm gonna start with our normal Zoom housekeeping. Your Zoom toolbar is probably located at the bottom of your screen, <clears throat> excuse me. And I just put a message into the chat. So that little icon might be flashing. So some Zoom housekeeping items, we do ask that you stay muted during the course of the Zoom unless you need to unmute yourself to ask a question. It minimizes background noise and helps us stay focused and move forward um, without distraction. The Zoom toolbar is also where you will find your mute and unmute button, as well as your start and stop video button. If you need privacy or you're having a bad hair day or whatever, you can turn your video off or on as you wish. And it's also where you'll find the chat function, which is the best way to submit <clears throat> questions during the Q&A. You can ask new questions or ask us to clarify things that we're already talking about today. Because we have so many questions, it's a pretty good likelihood that we may not get to additional questions from the chat. So if you post a question and we don't get to it, or you think of another one for us to cover next week, feel free to send an email to info at condolaw.net and we will put that on the docket for next week. And if you could get those to us no later than 4 p.m. on Tuesday, that gives us time to prep and answer the questions for the Wednesday Q&A. So I also want to emphasize something that we say every week, which is our disclaimer, essentially, that we are not able to give legal advice in the context of this Zoom Q&A. You know, it seems like there's a little bit of an ebb and flow on this, but we have gotten a lot more questions lately where if the question is asking us for very specific advice, either by excerpting governing documents or describing in detail a situation that an association is dealing with. And we just need to remind everybody that we cannot give legal advice in the context of this Zoom. So we try to at least cover the subject matter of the question when we can in a way that's more broadly applicable. But you're gonna hear a lot of us saying things like, you should be you know, uh, asking this question of your association attorney if you, if you need an answer for your specific community. So, and by the same token, if somebody sends you one of these videos and says, well, CLG said this thing, so you have to do X, Y, Z, you can of course ignore that. Please also keep in mind that the chat function during these Zooms is intended for questions or requests for clarification, not for discussion or commentary like you see on the CAI message boards, for example. In particular, we hope participants will refrain from posting commentary of a legal nature, especially for those who are not lawyers. And also keep in mind that any commentary you see in the chat is not legal advice and cannot be relied on as such. I checked again last night and the Secretary of State online filings for nonprofit corporations is still not available. There does not seem to be any indication on the website as to when that function will return. So if you need to file your annual report or otherwise update your nonprofit corporate filing, you're going to have to print out the forms and mail them in. So keep that in mind. We are also still recommending that boards add to their standing meeting agenda a consideration of how your COVID protocols, if you have any, should change in light of how quickly the circumstances are changing related to COVID. I feel like every five minutes there's some new development with COVID and I'm sure we're all as tired of that as everybody else is, but something to keep in mind and add to your standing agenda. We also wanna remind everybody that April 30th, which is coming up here in just over a month is CA Law Day. And if you're interested in registering for that or learning more about the event, you can go to the Washington State Community Association's website, which is wscai.org. Chelsea, would you put that into the chat, wscai.org? So folks can go look at the events. There's a calendar, I think, calendar of events. And if you go to April 30th, you'll see CA Law Day. I will be speaking. Uh, so hopefully you'll come and see us. We'll have a booth and we can meet folks and actually be in person, which will be a nice change. <clears throat> 
And then the last announcement is that our new website just went live yesterday. So I don't know if any of you have visited our website lately, but there had been a change in the platform that was hosting our website. And it was made our website look really, really bad. <laughs> so we're excited that we went ahead and just sprang for a brand new website. Our URL is condolaw.net. Our most recent community associations handbook is available via PDF there. And it also links all of our Q&A videos as well as our blog articles. So check it out. If you see anything that you think needs fixing, feel free to tell us, but hopefully it'll be a good resource for people going forward. And those are all the announcements that we have. So I'm gonna jump into the questions unless Ken, did you have anything to cover before I do that? No, I'm good. Okay. I know I talk fast, I apologize, but we're trying to cover a lot of stuff here. So <laughs> if it's too fast, thankfully you can go back and, and watch the replay after the fact. Our first question is this, what can a homeowner do if they were not given proper notice of a meeting? This question came from one of our manager colleagues. And I think the answer probably depends on a number of factors, including whether the owner actually attended the meeting in question, what type of meeting it was, and what actions the association took at that meeting. I don't know if we're talking about a board meeting, association meeting, you know, there's a lot of different variables. I think generally the, the, what an owner can do if they were not given proper notice of a meeting is to challenge the validity of any actions taken at that meeting. And their form of that challenge could run the gamut from, you know, sending a letter to the board telling them they didn't get notice and disagreeing with what happened at, the, that, that, at that meeting, all the way to the under, other end of the spectrum, including they could sue the association, I suppose, depending on how egregious they felt the issue was. So if you're anticipating that this might happen, so, you know, let's say you as the manager, you've realized, nobody else pointed it out, but you realized that somehow a particular owner got left off of the notice list or that notice was sent in a manner that's not uh, authorized. Maybe it went out by email and not everybody's opted in. You could just schedule a new meeting, send the notice correctly to all of the owners and have the board or the association ratify the actions that were taken at that previous meeting. In other words, you correct your procedure and then of course make sure that your procedure is corrected for each of the meetings going forward into the future. I will also point out that there are sometimes in governing documents provisions that say if an owner attended the meeting despite not having received proper notice, that that is essentially a waiver of their right to notice because if they actually show up then whether or not they got proper notice they're there so they're waiving the right to proper notice. So that's very document specific. And so if you're dealing with this particular situation for one of your communities, I think it would be worth checking with the association attorney, especially if you are already dealing with an owner challenging that meeting based on their the lack of proper notice. Ken, did you want to add anything to that? Good. Okay. Here is our next question. Under 6490, which is Wakaiowa, can a board of directors vote to remove a board member? Or do they have to have two thirds approval voted by the community? <clears throat> so the short answer is no. In most cases, a board cannot remove someone from the board entirely without a vote of the owners. And if you look at the section of the RCW, it's 649520. It says that an owner vote is required to remove a board member from the board entirely, except if, an, if the board member is delinquent in their payment of assessments for more than 60 days, and if they fail to cure the delinquency within 30 days of notice being given of the board's intent to remove them. So they have to be 60 days or more past due, then the board has to send that board member a notice that they're gonna be removed from the board if they don't cure their delinquency within 30 days. And if they fail to cure within the 30 days, then the board can remove them. That's the only scenario under Wakaiowa where the board on its own can remove someone entirely from the board. Otherwise, the ownership as a whole has to vote. You have to call a meeting for the purpose of removing somebody from the board. And at the meeting, you have to achieve a quorum. You know, you can use a combination of in-person proxies or a ballot in order to achieve that quorum. And you need either a majority of the votes within the association or two thirds of the votes cast at that meeting in order to remove the board member, whichever is less. 
So either 50% or more than 50% of the voting power in the community or two thirds of the votes cast at that meeting once you've achieved quorum, whichever is less. Ken, did you wanna add anything before I keep going? No, nope, I'm good. All right, we might get to all of these after all. Our next question is, can you touch again on the subject of charging a monthly fee to dog owners? besides the move-in fee. I seem to remember at one time it was mentioned that this is not a good idea. And you, you're remembering correctly, that's the short answer, but I, what I'm doing is I'm putting into the chat a link to our YouTube channel, to the actual video of the Q&A where we talked about this. And the issue of pet fees is covered around halfway through. If you look at the description under the video at the link that I just sent you, you can see the, the topics that we covered in order. And that was one of them. <clears throat> Our next question is, does a board have the authority to accept or reject a lease or a renter that is presented by an owner? Or can the board just require a copy of the lease? And is it up to the owner who they rent to? Most governing documents do not give the board authority to approve or reject specific prospective tenants. And we advise our clients in general to edit that authority out when they do have it in their documents and they're, they're doing an amendment. <clears throat> Excuse me, I've got a tickle in my throat. If you do have language like this in your documents, you are probably ineligible for FHA certification and that matters for some communities. You know, not all communities care about that, but some do. Exercising authority like this can give rise to claims that the board, you know, discriminated against a tenant for impermissible reasons or a claim by the owner against the association that the association interfered with that owner's business interests by rejecting a tenant that the owner thought was good. And the owner could make a claim against the association for lost rental income as a result of interfering with that business relationship. So we think that it's not a great idea to have this in your documents. If you do, we don't think you should exercise this authority. We think it is reasonable for a, an association to amend documents and require that an owner provide the association with a copy of the lease. You can also even require that an owner conduct a tenant screening, as long as the documents also don't require the tenant, sorry, the owner to provide copies of that to the association. So the owner should be the one screening tenants, the owner should be the one deciding who gets to rent their home. And I think the association should limit its involvement in that process to, uh, certainly it's reasonable to request a copy of the lease be kept on file with the association. Ken, did you wanna add anything to that? Yeah, probably the uh, association can't or is not entitled to a copy of a tenant screening report unless the tenant has specifically authorized disclosure of that information to the association. And that generally doesn't happen. Usually the tenant is authorizing disclosure to the landlord, not to anybody else. So uh, we've had clients where they, they were demanding the landlord provide the report and we had to advise them that, that the landlord could not legally give the report to them because of the way the laws are written to protect the tenants. Thank you, Ken. All right, here's our next question. Am I correct in my thinking? The board has the authority to change, add, delete rules and regulations without an owner vote, as long as those are, rules and regulations are discussed in an open meeting and governing document changes require a vote of the owners. So I first wanna clarify that rules and regulations are a governing document. They're just a different kind than your declaration and your bylaws. And so each governing document is intended to sort of contain a certain set of restrictions and rights and responsibilities. And the declaration, for example, is where things that are restrictions on uses belong. Rules are not intended to contain things like restrictions on use, but can, contain things about like how you want your community to like the vibe, I guess, for lack of a better word. So that's where you would include things like what your quiet hours are and picking up after your dog if you have dogs in the common spaces or other things that sort of govern the general feel and interaction between people within the community. Wakaiwa communities are required to give notice to the owners of any proposed change to the rules and regulations. 
They have to send out the proposed new set of rules to the ownership and provide the owners with an opportunity to comment. And only after that has occurred, can the board adopt the rules and send them out to the owners to be enforced going forward. non wakaiowa communities are generally not required to give advance notice to their owners of their intent to change the rules. The board can vote to adopt new rules and send them out to the owners. And after a reasonable notice period, they become enforceable. We get a lot of questions about how much notice has to be given and is there like a statutory requirement to give 30 days notice. There is no statutory guideline as to the specific amount of notice. It just has to be reasonable. We think 30 days is reasonable, but we probably could make a case for a little more or less notice depending on the circumstances. Amendments to the declaration do require a vote of the owners, and this is where things like, you know, rental restrictions or smoking bans, things like that would belong. And bylaws can, can sometimes be amended by the board without a vote of the owners, and other times they do require a vote of the owners, depending on what the documents themselves say. And so all of this probably illustrates my next point, which is that when you're amending your documents, it's a really good idea to check with your association attorney to make sure that you are putting things in the right documents, but also following the correct procedures for changing those documents, whichever ones they are. And I'll offer one last comment, and certainly I what not imputing this intent to the person who asked the question, but you can't circumvent an owner vote by putting something into the rules that's supposed to be in the declaration, if that makes sense. So like you can't adopt a, spoke, a smoking ban by putting it into the rules. That's the kind of thing that would probably have to be a restriction on use that's written into the declaration. So, Ken, did you want to add anything to that, or should we keep going? Uh, two things. One is that the CCNRs or the um, the declaration, and maybe even the bylaws, might also contain specific procedures that the board has to follow in order to adopt the rules. So you need to make sure that you've looked at that. Uh, if it just follows the statutory language, then there's a single sentence that says the board may adopt rules. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is that the rules are going to have to be adopted at an open meeting if you are a Ukiowa or HOA community. You can't do it without having a meeting, and in theory, then the membership is going to be informed if they want to be that the board is dealing with the rules and is making changes. So you don't, you don't get to issue rules bypassing the procedures for open meetings. And I'll offer as an extension to that, even if you don't have an open meeting requirement, and even if you're not a Wakaiowa community that has to give your owners notice in advance of a rules change, I think in a lot of circumstances, it's a great idea to tell your owners you're considering changing the rules and to invite owner input into that process. So there's nothing that says you can't do that. And I think that for the purpose of transparency and encouraging owner involvement in the community, that might be a good idea for many associations to consider. Here's our next question. I have a question about the use of the word shall in governing documents. I see it very often. Does shall mean must or mandatory or does it provide wiggle room? This is a very easy answer to give, thankfully. Shall means must, and it is mandatory. I will only, the only other caveat that I will say is provisions within governing documents can't be interpreted effectively like excerpt by excerpt. So I can't look at a sentence or a clause that contains the word shall and tell you definitively what that means because it's part of a larger document and that's how I would need to interpret the meeting. But shall does mean must and is generally mandatory and does not give wiggle room. So we have a scope. Oh, do you want to make add one comment on yeah. that? So <clears throat> uh, we do have a lot of people who get obsessed with the shall or must. So if the declaration says that the board shall enforce the rules and regulations, that does not create an absolute because we know that uh, Ukiowa has set out a very a good set of guidelines for the board's discretion to enforce rules, regulations, et cetera. And if it's not in the best interest of the association to do it, they, uh, they do not have to enforce. And so just as with many other things, these answers become very fact specific and you cannot 
use a blanket rule and argue that because the word shall is in the document, there is no other alternative legal support for a different decision. Agreed. And, you know, to your example, the sentence saying the board shall be the one to enforce the rules. I mean, I think that's how I would interpret that sentence, right? The board shall enforce the governing documents. You can either fixate on the word shall, or you can fixate on what I think the intent of that sentence is, which is the board shall enforce the governing documents, meaning there's no other entity that's authorized to do that. We have another question from the same person. Let's say the membership changed the CCNRs to ban certain activities, for example, horses or certain businesses, but some lot owners own horses and have barns and riding arenas or have businesses that provide income. Would the HOA be required to compensate the owners for their potential loss or would they be automatically grandfathered in or would the lot owners have to adhere to the new restrictions? I wanna start by just very briefly commenting on the term grandfathered in. It's, it's no longer a preferred term because it is rooted in racism. And if you just Google, why do we not use the term grandfathered anymore? It'll give you the history of the term. We don't have a great replacement yet. So that is the one challenge when trying to find a different way to talk about grandfathered in. We've, some people use the term legacy. That's I think an imperfect word. So we're working on it. Uh, but I want to focus on the question, the, the substance of the question, and the ability to amend the governing documents to restrict a use such as banning horses or banning businesses probably depends on whether a buyer could anticipate under the existing documents when they purchased whether that, could, that type of change could happen. And there's a case that speaks to this, which is the Wilkerson versus Chihuahua case. And that case essentially stood for the proposition that if the type of restriction that the association enacts is not foreseeable to a potential buyer based on the documents as they existed at the time, then it's not enforceable against that buyer. So it does become very specific to both the governing documents of the community in question and the circumstances of the individual community, the type of use that you're trying to restrict. And I will say that one of the risks you take when you purchase a, a home within a community association is that the restrictions can change if another, enough owners support that change. And much of the time you are stuck with those changes if they are done properly, with the exception of certain scenarios like what was covered in the Chihuahua case. Some amendments can be adopted, though, by current owners, but only take effect over time as people sell their properties to new owners. So one, one way that we've had communities get support for an amendment that they feel is really important, but that current owners are sort of leery about voting for, is to, as the question person said, grandfather in or kind of create a legacy status for current owners and only have that amendment, that restriction take effect as people sell their properties within the community. Other amendments do take effect immediately against all current owners. And then as to the question about whether the association has an obligation to compensate owners for losses that result from these types of new restrictions, the associations don't have an obligation to compensate owners in general for those types of losses. So if the association followed its procedures correctly and the restriction is actually enforceable, there's no obligation to compensate owners for any financial loss that might result from that. Did you wanna add anything to that, Ken? No, this, it's just, this is a very specific kind of question. The analysis is incredibly dependent on the wording of your uh, CCNRs or your declaration. And so if you're considering something like this, you need to get some professional help. Thank you, Ken. All right, next question. <clears throat> Is there an RCW that prohibits a board member from being paid to perform their duties, specifically a treasurer? One of our associations is talking about paying the treasurer to perform their duties, but that just doesn't seem right. Is there a law that addresses this? There is no RCW that prohibits this, and actually there's a section of the Nonprofit Corporations Act that, that specifically allows it if the association's procedures are followed, but we generally recommend against it. And there are lots of governing documents that also provide that board members may not be paid for executing their duties as board members. 
the flip side of that is if a board member is providing additional services to the association going beyond what normal board member duties would include, like if the treasurer is also doing the bookkeeping for the association, that goes beyond normal board member duties. And it might be possible, depending on the documents, to pay that person for their services. We do always tell our clients considering this to make sure that they disclose it to the community and also that you consult with your association attorney first. We have another question about this topic. And actually, I'm just going to jump ahead to that one because they're related. And there's other commentary that will be helpful, I think, uh, for both of these scenarios. So the other question is, if a board member wants to take care of the weed control in the park area, can we pay him not only for the product purchased, but also for his time? Does the board need to approve the invoice each time? Our office has a strict policy of paying only licensed, bonded, and insured contractors to complete work. Would this be a liability to my company? So I want to start by saying that we don't advise management companies on liability or other issues. So we are going to limit our comments to if and when this is permissible for an association to do and limit our commentary to that. So as we already discussed, if a board member or any owner is doing extra work for the community, the board may choose to pay that member for the work performed. This is, of course, subject, as I mentioned, to limitations in the governing documents. It should be disclosed to the owners. And one thing you do want to be careful about is the relationship that you are creating between the association and the person doing the work. You are creating either an employee-employer relationship or a contractor relationship with that person. And especially when it's physical work, we want to make sure that our clients are not becoming employers under state or federal law whenever possible, because then that gives rise to a whole nother set of obligations that the association has to meet in order to uh, not run afoul of the law. You also want to make sure that your insurance will cover any injury to the person that's doing the work and make sure that you properly document the contractor relationship, for example, and report the income that you have paid to that person to the IRS via a 1099. So there's a lot of different things that you want to consider that sort of complicate what seems like maybe it should be a really straightforward thing to do. And hopefully those comments are helpful to the folks that are asking. Ken, did you want to add anything to that? Uh, just that uh, it raises the question about if you're letting volunteers do physical work on the property as well, and you might want to look at your insurance to make sure that it would cover any injuries to the volunteers and that it would cover any damage caused by the volunteers. And it's relatively inexpensive insurance, but it does also treat it as if you created an employer employee relationship, which then you're insuring yourself for as an organization. Thanks, Ken. <clears throat> All right, our next question. Would adding a large new playset to a playground area that did not have one originally be considered a capital improvement? The HOA has two playgrounds. One already has a playset, but the other smaller playground never has had one, and the board wants to put one on it. So the short answer is that probably, yes, this is a capital improvement. It's something that didn't exist in the past, and you're putting this new thing there. So it probably is a capital improvement. You know, capital improvement is not well defined by our statutes, but I think it's probably a safe bet that something brand new that didn't exist before is a capital improvement. Sometimes the governing documents contain limits on what types of improvements the board can institute unilaterally and what requires an owner vote. Typically there's a dollar amount attached to when the board can make the decision on its own and when they have to put it to a vote of the owners. So we also probably can't answer this question without reviewing the governing documents and understanding like the total cost of the project. But the safest route to take would be for the board to call a meeting of the owners and get an ownership vote to approve the expenditure. Because that way, even if it is a capital improvement and even if it does exceed any dollar amount limitation that might exist in the governing documents, you are reducing the risk, if not eliminating it, by getting a vote of the owners to approve the project. Did you have anything you want to add to that, Ken? Yeah, there is Washington case law that has looked at the definition of what a capital improvement is for uh, condominium associations. 
And that did focus on whether or not it was a replacement of something existing. And so <clears throat> the reason I would just say this is a, a yes, it's a capital improvement is because the fact pattern given to me is that there was no playground equipment before. If there had been any kind of playground equipment before, uh, improvements to it based on the type of, uh, you know, the quality of the materials or the size might have to be looked at under the criteria that the court set for defining a capital improvement. Thanks, Ken. All right, here's our next question. I have a couple of questions regarding collections. Does state law require that invoices for annual assessments be sent out a certain number of days prior to be becoming due? What about other types of assessments such as fines? Also, are late notices required to be sent out within a certain number of days after a due date? So none of our governing statutes specify a particular notice period for assessments that are due. Some governing documents do contain specific instruction on notifying owners in advance of when assessments are due. So you need to look to your governing documents, at least in part, to answer these questions. All associations in Washington state have to follow the budget ratification process that's described in Wakiowa which includes notifying the owners ahead of time of a whole set of information, which includes the amount of the assessments by property, lot, unit, whatever, and when they are due. And most of our clients also send out notices after the budget is ratified, telling people, okay, the budget's ratified, your assessments are X, they're due on this date. Some of them provide coupons to the owners to make it easier for them to pay. And as a practical matter, we do think it makes sense to, to give a reasonable amount of notice and essentially to do whatever you can as an association to make it easy for owners to pay. So that's, a, that's talking about regular assessments. Fines can't be assessed without complying with your fine policy and giving the owner a due process notification before the fine is assessed. The notice period has to be reasonable, and in most cases, we would suggest a minimum of 10 days before assessing a fine. There is no statutory requirement for when late notices have to be sent out, like how soon after an account becomes delinquent. But every association should have a collection policy and should file, follow the timelines that are outlined there. And again, you're also going to want to look to what your CCNRs may say about your CCNRs sometimes will say things like an assessment's due, due and payable on the first of the quarter or the month or the year and is late if not paid within 10 days or 20 days or 30 days, whatever the case might be. So you want your collection policy to be consistent with what your CCNRs say about those timelines. And the other thing that I will offer is that there are statutory notices that do have to be sent before you can foreclose on an association lien. So that's something to be aware of. But otherwise, I think that answers all the questions. If you need any clarification, you can feel free to put that into the chat. And Ken, did you want to add anything to that? Good. Okay. We are making good time. Um, here's our next question. As a rule, our management company does not apply late fees and or interest to compliance fines. We have a board that is asking that we apply late fees and interest on compliance fines. What is your recommendation if the governing documents are silent on this issue? I will start by saying that a properly assessed fine is an assessment. And unless the governing documents say otherwise, an association can choose to charge late fees and interest on any past due assessment balance, regardless of its composition. Now, there is risk in adding penalties to fines, especially when an owner is paying their regular assessments and is only ignoring the fines and the resulting late fees. And it also probably matters if the owner has cured the violation for which they were fined or if the violation is continuing. You can also record a lien for unpaid fines, including any late fees that have accrued on that fine amount and take many other steps to collect the balance due. However, you cannot foreclose on a balance due that is not that is composed entirely of fines and other penalties. In 2021, the legislature adopted changes to all of our governing community association statutes that set up, in addition to other requirements, a threshold balance due that has to be met
before you can foreclose an association lien or file a foreclosure. And that threshold means that you have to, the owner has to be delinquent by either $200 or three months assessments, whichever amount is larger. And you have to calculate that amount exclusive of any other charges on the account. And we don't think you can circumvent that by applying payments to certain types of charges and not to other types of charges. So that's really the only limitation that exists when the balance due is composed of fines and late fees. I can't really say that we recommend necessarily one approach or the other across the board, but we do suggest that if a board is grappling with this issue, they should consult with the association attorney who can review the governing documents and walk through any restrictions that might exist there. And the attorney can also review the fine notices to tell the board whether those fines are enforceable. They can also talk with the board about whether this is an ongoing violation or whether we're talking about, you know, a fine from two years ago that's got two years worth of late fees on it and nothing else on the account. So you can understand, the board can better understand the options and the relative risks of those different approaches, I guess. Ken, did you want to add anything to that? Well, I'll just offer, I think that some of the accounting software that management companies and associations use have a difficult time dealing with late fees and interest. And so it's certainly not uncommon for us to receive management ledgers or ledgers from a, a client that don't include any late fees or interest of any kind on any type of assessment. Uh -huh. And that can be challenging because the individual owners may be requesting their ledgers and balances due and they're receiving information that doesn't reflect the late fees and interest which they may be charged by the association under the documents. So trying to become consistent in what your um, what your ledgers look like and how you're communicating with owners I think becomes important. So if they are being assessed late fees and interest on any kind of an assessment that needs to be communicated to them regularly as you deal with them. Thanks, Ken. All right, next question. As it pertains to a rental unit within a condo, which provision or law takes precedence, landlord tenant or the association's declaration? Specifically asking about the limitations or requirements on landlords before they can enter a rental unit versus the condo declaration sections on accessing units. So landlord tenant laws govern the relationship between the landlord, the owner of the unit and the tenant, while the condo association documents govern the relationship between the association and the owner. Landlord tenant laws have rules about how much notice a landlord has to give in order to enter a rent rental home and what you have to do in order to give proper notice and condo declarations don't generally cover specifics like this. In other words, the declaration clearly might say that you have the right to access a unit, but it doesn't tell you exactly how to do it. And as a practical matter, unless there's like an actual emergency, like a pipe has burst and there's water gushing out in the, in the moment, we generally tell our association clients that unless you have specific permission from the occupant to enter the unit, you shouldn't do that without a court order, even if the documents say that you can. So beyond these generalities, it's difficult to say how to handle an association needing to access a tenant occupied unit without knowing more about the specifics, including why you need access, whether there's an emergency, what your relationship is with the owner. Um, and I think that an association dealing with this situation should consider consulting with the association's attorney. But I, I just want to remind everybody listening that to the extent possible, you need to remember and and keep as sort of a guiding principle that the association's relationship is with the owner, not with the tenant. And you don't want to insert yourself too far into that owner-tenant relationship so that you don't create liability for the association by undertaking things that are not within your scope of authority. Ken, did you have anything you want to add to that? Well, I would suggest that associations should try asking and persuading tenants and owners to get them access uh, rather than taking the sort of rigid position that they have a right to come into the unit. Uh, it's just an expensive right to enforce. Uh, we've had clients where they were trying to, to get access to a unit for an active leak and an, a resident has refused. We've had this happen both with owners and with tenants. Uh, 
<clears throat> and the, the challenge is that short of getting a court order, you are not going to have the right to literally break into the unit with a sheriff or police officer at your side. And uh, that's an expensive and time consuming process. So anything you can do to help the tenant understand or work around their schedule is going to be less expensive and probably better than uh, trying to use the force that you are entitled to in the declaration. Thank you, Ken. Here's our next question. For an amenity that does not permit pets, what are the rules regarding a service dog? In other words, can we ask for documentation that it is truly a service dog, not a pet or emotional support? So the first thing we wanna say is the thing we say every time we talk about questions like this, service animals and emotional support animals are not legally pets. So they're not treated like pets. They, they have different legal rights or the owner has different rights with respect to a service animal and an emotional support animal than they do with respect to a pet. And if an owner requests an accommodation allowing them to bring their service animal or their emotional support animal into a common area that generally does not permit pets, the board needs to remember when evaluating that request that an emotional support animal or service animal is not a pet. And you have to determine based on that information whether the accommodation requested is reasonable. In general, an owner an owner's right to have a service animal or an emotional support animal is not limited to just their unit. It includes the common areas in general. We strongly recommend that associations dealing with requests like these consult with their association attorney as they respond, because there are limitations on what you can ask for. I mean, part of the question was, can we ask for documentation that it's truly a service dog, not a pet or emotional support animal? You. There are certain types of documentation that you can ask for. You, you can't ask for medical records. If an owner's disability is not evident, you can ask whether they have a disability. But if they show the association or provide the association with a letter from a, a healthcare provider, for example, that says this person is disabled and they need this animal in order to fully enjoy their home, including the common areas, then the association needs to evaluate that as a reasonable accommodation, not a request to let my dog, who is my pet, into the pool area with me, right? So I can envision a scenario in which you would still say, look, no, the animal can't go there. So I think uh, somebody is probably entitled to bring their service animal into the pool area, but you probably don't have to let them take the dog in the pool with them, right? So this is not an unlimited right the accommodation made has to be reasonable or requested it has to be reasonable. It isn't absolute, but you wanna be really careful when responding to these kinds of requests. That's why I'm saying you should check with your association attorney because if you do sort of mess up the response here, then the, the person could file a fair housing complaint and those are investigated by the Washington State Human Resources Com uh, Commission, sorry, Human Rights Commission. And most of those investigations start out from the assumption that the association impermissibly discriminated against the person with a disability. And they very rarely end well for associations when, when you're being investigated by those entities. So, so I think, remember that support animals and emotional support animals are not pets. Consult with your attorney when you're dealing with these situations because you don't wanna run afoul of the fair housing laws. Ken, did you wanna add anything to that? I think you covered it. Okay. All right, here's our next question. I have a couple of associations that I currently managed that are governed under the old Condo Act. Is there a list of statutes from the new Condo Act and Wakiowa that apply to old act condos? So we can't provide a list, but RCW 6434010, which I'm gonna paste that citation into the chat, contains a list of the new act condo provisions that apply to old act condos. And as for Wakiowa, there are only a few such sections that apply automatically to pre-existing communities. And I'm gonna put a list of those into the chat as well. So basically the sections that allow the associations to opt into Wakiowa more easily than they might otherwise amend their documents, 
the budget ratification sections and the reserve study sections are the ones that apply to the specific sections that I just put into the chat are the sections of Wakayawa that apply to everybody. Ken, did you want to add anything? <clears throat> there is one section of Ukiowa that applies to uh, plant communities or single family home communities only and does not apply to condominiums. And that one relates to uh, the budgeting process. And that one wipes out any kind of provisions that limit the association's authority to increase uh, dues. And you know, I think you've got that in another question as you're well. You're totally stealing my thunder on the next question. <laughs> it's so, just that that one provision is unique in Ukiowa in that it applies only to uh, single family home communities that are covered by RCW 34, or 64.38, uh, whereas all the others apply to every type of, of community. Yes, and Ken is previewing the answer to our next question, which is, I know you have discussed this many times. However, here's my question. <clears throat> Does Wakiowa overrule a more restrictive set of documents on approving a budget? Wakiowa says 51% is required to vote down a proposed budget. Our bylaws require 51% to approve a budget that has an increase of more than 5%. Does Wakiowa overrule? And so the short answer to this question is, Yes, in, in relating to the section of Wakiowa that Ken was just talking about, which is 6490080, this is the section that provides that for any single family home plat communities, the Wakiowa provisions on budgeting supersede, meaning wipe out, invalidate, existing provisions of the governing documents. And so specifically this a requirement that 51% of your ownership approve a budget if the increase in assessments is more than 5% from the previous budget, that is no longer uh, valid. That part of your documents has been wiped out. So under the budget ratification section for Wakaiwa, unless the unit owners of units to which a majority of the votes in the association are allocated, or any larger percentage specified in the declaration reject the budget, then it's ratified. So this particular section 080 includes caps on increases in assessments if you're a plat community. The 51% or majority vote is the minimum required to reject a budget. If your governing documents, let's say your, your declaration says that, um, you know, a budget's automatically ratified unless 60% of the owners vote to reject it, then that, you know, that is consistent with Wakaiowa. Wakaiowa only provides the minimum vote required to, to reject a budget. Ken, did you want to add anything to that? Oh, nope, I'm good. Okay. Next question. Most declarations have nuisance clauses. Do you have any guidance to assist a board in determining what rises to the level of nuisance? Is there a good guideline or is it entirely subjective? So I'm gonna start here and then ask Ken to jump in with additional comments. The nuisance provisions are pretty broad in general because it's not possible to predict anything that might be a nuisance within a community. And so to that, to that, degree or extent, I guess they are subjective as the person who submitted the question uh, commented. There are ways to make nuisance issues less subjective. I mean, one thing you could do is in your rules, adopt a set of guidelines about what things are considered a nuisance. You could also look to local ordinances about nuisance, including things like what, how loud does something have to be before it's considered a noise nuisance? And you could adopt those as some objective standards of nuisance within your particular community. But it's, it, you know, as I said to begin with, it's kind of impossible to predict anything that could be a nuisance because people find all kinds of creative and new ways to be super annoying that you could never think about until it actually happens. And, and so it's impossible to write every possible nu nuisance into a document. And Ken, did you have more that you wanted to add on this one? Well, I had a nuisance come up this week I'd never heard of before, <clears throat> which was in a single family community where one of the owners decided to do beekeeping as a hobby. So they had moved beehives onto their lot and the neighbors were complaining because of the number of bees and the number of animals and children that were being stung by the bees. And so they, there's clearly no restriction on 
uh, written into the documents about beehives. But I did point out that the, the provision against nuisance and annoyance could be used in a situation like that to uh, prohibit the beehive. That's an interesting example. All right, here is our next question. How should the board handle installation of ring or blink cameras in condo associations? Is there anything I as a manager should encourage the board to enforce? For example, like a posting that surveillance is happening or telling people they can't point cameras at their neighbors. So there's not a lot of guidance out there about this kind of stuff. And I think one place that you can see a really robust discussion about different approaches is if you go to the CAI national message boards, because there's a lot of discussion about doorbell cameras on the message board. So that's one good place to look if you want to see a you know, variety of points of view on this. Basically, what we are what we would encourage any board to consider is balancing an owner's legitimate right to feel secure in their own home against another owner's perceived right of privacy. And the reason I say perceived is because no legal right to privacy exists in a public or quasi public space. So, you know, if I install a ring doorbell camera on my peephole or on my actual doorbell, there, it's only going to be seeing areas that are visible from my front door. And if you're in a space that's visible from my front door, you're not in a space where you have a reasonable expectation of privacy. One option that an association could consider, of course, is just not regulating these. Ken mentioned that he was in a community at a client meeting last week where every single home within the community had some sort of doorbell camera uh, installed on their door. So it really depends on your community. If you have particular concerns, those are probably easier to deal with as they come up. I don't think that I see a lot of communities establishing, you know, like a set of rules or regulations around the installation of these ring doorbell cameras. But Ken, did you have anything that you wanted to add to that one? No, I just know I've seen a lot of comments on the national message board for CAI. Okay. Yeah, so check that out. And if you find anything helpful, let us know. All right, our last question that was submitted in advance is this one. Our complex clubhouse is big with a lot of rooms and offices. Can we rent them as office spaces for non-residents? So the short answer to this question is it's too specific for us to answer in the context of the Zoom. And the reason is that there are a lot of variables that would go into answering this question. And I can certainly cover some of what those variables are. I mean, one, of course, it depends on what your CCNRs say. It might also depend on local zoning laws or ordinances, because almost certainly a HOA or a condo community is zoned as residential, and so might not allow for commercial office space. It might depend also on whether you're renting things out on a short-term basis versus a long-term basis. Many governing documents also have a provision that say an association can't operate a business for profit, and this could run afoul of that. So those are a lot of the different factors we would have to look at in, in order to evaluate whether this is a reasonable thing for any individual community to do, but we can't give a definitive answer in, in this Q&A. Ken, did you wanna add anything to that? No, I think you covered it. Okay, so I think we have one other question from the chat and, and that might be it. Um, I'm trying to work with an association about who is responsible for the skylights. The association is paint in. <clears throat> the declaration doesn't specifically identify skylights as a homeowner responsibility, but windows are a homeowner responsibility. It would seem to me that they are part of the roof envelope. Do you have comments on that, Ken? Uh, I do. My guess would be the person writing the answer that it seemed to be part of the roof envelope has a skylight. <laughs> I would normally say that the skylights are windows. And if the declaration has something specific about windows for the assignment of responsibility, I would apply that to the skylights as well. The integration between the window and the siding system is really not any different than the integration between the skylight and the roofing system. But it is all gonna depend on what the declaration specifically calls for um, and <clears throat> we certainly, when we rewrite the documents for a number of communities, 
will add the skylights and the specific allocation of responsibility. And we even have some where they'll separate at the pieces of the skylight. So the skylight assembly, the glass and the uh, frame around it that sets on the curb for the roof might be the owner's responsibility where the curb and the flashing into the roofing system might remain the association's responsibility. So you can write the documents to provide any allocation of cost and any allocation of performance responsibility. It's just a matter of, of trying to do that. But absent something contrary, we would normally recommend that you be treating uh, skylights as windows and whatever applies to windows would apply to them. Thanks, Ken. We just had one other question about the nuisance thing come in over the chat. What about security lights shining directly into a neighbor's house 12 to 14 hours a day? I, one comment that I can offer is that a lot of local jurisdictions have uh, ordinances or limitations on light pollution. So one thing you could look at is it, whether your local jurisdiction does have a limit to that. But other, other than that, Ken, what would you say when it comes to shining lights in your neighbor's houses? Uh, there are cases which have been reported in uh, CAI's National Law Reporter, which have found that the light shining into the neighbor's home is a nuisance. I think they found that both under the governing documents for the community and under the state's nuisance law. So uh, in most cases, the problem can be solved by shielding the light from uh, shining into the neighbor's property. And the courts have been very specific about uh, looking at the ability to shield the light. I know there is a, at least one Washington court case relating to lighting, which was a Mercer Island community uh, issue. So uh, I think that, you know, again, we'd need to know more specifics, but certainly a security light shining on a neighbor's property is recognized by the courts as a nuisance. And in many communities like Seattle and Mercer Island, there are specific municipal codes related to that light shining on the neighbor's property. Thanks, Ken. Well, I think that that is all the questions that I'm seeing in the chat, unless anybody messaged you individually. So I think we might be at the end of our questions. Thank you again for joining us. We're happy to have you with us each week and we will see you here next week. Bye everybody.